at a wedding ceremony. <clears throat> maybe you heard it read, or maybe it wasn't yours. And so, these famous words from Paul, please hear them again with fresh ears. <clears throat> if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I, have a prophetic, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. There is no word more readily and more systematically abused than the word love. Do you agree with me on that? How many of you love pizza? <laughs> or you love that new TV show? Or you love that book you just read? Or that new app on your phone that keeps you up until 2 o'clock in the morning? We say we love things when it is more accurate to say that we like them or prefer them. I think we abuse the word love in our relationships, too. We love our husband or wife. We love our children or parents. We love our dog, cat, fish, ferret, snake, or bird, or whatever other creepy crawly you have in your house. <laughs> and yet our love is often conditional. It is a feeling we have, something that is fickle, something that can change, something that doesn't have to stick around for long. And if you don't believe me, ask an eighth grader what love is. And so... In our relationships with other living things, love is often just a word for what happens when something captures our interest for a little while. It's an infatuation. Love is a preference. Love is an opinion. Love is only a feeling. Now, somebody in the first service really got ahead of me quoting all these old songs and all these old bands, so... Pause with me for a second. You know, the Beatles, they sang in the 1960s, All You Need Is Love. In the 1970s, you had Bob Marley singing about One Love, right? How many of you had that album, <coughs> the Legends album? Anybody? Yes, a couple people like Bob Marley out here. Okay. Lenny Kravitz in 1990s saying that we need to let love rule. They all thought they were capturing that idea of the transcendent nature of love. But they thought there are, their songs would argue that love is more than a feeling, to borrow another great band from the 70s, Boston. <laughs> well, these musical descriptions, along with our messy use of the word love in our everyday life, well, they're all incomplete. They're all imprecise. They fail to capture what Jesus meant when he replied to the question of a young lawyer. And he taught us to love our neighbor and to love God. And, and he boiled it all down. All those Law of Moses, laws of Moses, all the teachings of the prophets. To that one sentence, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. But you know what? The early Christians picked up on what Jesus was teaching and saying, and they even went further with it. The Gospel of, of John describes the love of God as the action of God giving us his only begotten Son, so that we may have eternal life in John 3.16. In the letter of 1 John, which is really called the love book, you can see we have one quote up here. Let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Well, elsewhere in that same letter, the writer of that letter states unequivocally that God is love. And that everything in existence emerges out of that love that has come into our world. 
And then we have 1 Corinthians 13, that very famous and familiar text to all of us. We've heard it at weddings, we've heard songs based on this text, maybe we've even written it down to understand what love is and what love isn't when we are trying to define it for ourselves. <coughs> but maybe if you're like me, you've just kind of read those 13 verses and said, okay, this is the complete knowledge of love and don't have to read it in context. We, we don't have to read the rest of the letter to understand what Paul is trying to say to the people of Corinth. And maybe you, like, like me, have missed the point that Paul is making about love here. You see, Paul argues that love is an action, not an emotion. Love is what we do as Christians. It is more important than any spiritual gift we have. It is more important than any God-given talent. It is more than the work that we do that gives us a paycheck. It's more than what we are good at in our private lives. Paul says that everything is meaningless in our life if we do not have love. If you do not love, well, you are nothing. If you do not love, well, you don't really say anything. If you do not love, then you gain nothing. If you do not love, then you give nothing to this world. These are some pretty bold statements from Paul, aren't they? Now, most scholars believe that the people of Corinth were a pretty divided people, a very diverse group of people. I like to think that Corinth, in many ways, is like New York City, eight million people living on that little island, all with their own different viewpoints. It was a popular center of trade. People from all over the ancient world lived together in that society. And what became important for the people of Corinth was business. Profit, wealth, success, all these things were valued. And because it was such a cosmopolitan type of world, carnal pleasures and worldly pleasures were pursued over other things. Perceptions and reputation was the most important thing to try to capture in life. Now, does that sound familiar to any of us? Does that kind of sound like where we live here in the United States? Isn't perception and wealth and success the things that we value in many ways in this world? I think we spend a lot of time in our life judging and categorizing others and, and trying to understand where we fit in. And, and oftentimes when we do that type of work, we, we put others down to raise ourselves up. And you know what? For the people of Corinth, that was something they were struggling with too. The people argued about whose theology was better or what minister baptized their family and how that minister meant to them. And, oh, I was <coughs> baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Peter. Or maybe they would argue about the time when the potluck would happen and who they would actually invite because they knew some people had better access to food than others. And why would you invite the people that would only bring Jesus? In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul even has to put the people of the Corinthian church in their place because they're squabbling over who has the better spiritual gift. Is speaking in a foreign language and interpreting that speech more important than being a teacher? Is preaching better than having wisdom? Is helping others better than suffering on behalf of Christ? At the end of chapter 12, though, Paul reminds the church that we are all a part of the body of Christ, no matter our status, no matter our gifts, no matter the maturity we have in our faith, <coughs> no matter our wealth. If one part suffers, he writes, all of us suffer. If one part rejoices then all of us rejoice. And it is then that he goes into this discussion about love. The first statement that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 13 is that love is greater than our spiritual gifts. It's greater than speaking in tongues, greater than prophecy, greater than self-sacrifice, and it's greater than us. Secondly, we learn that love is defined by our actions, our attitude, and behavior. And this is going to be the lengthy part of the sermon, sorry. But, but he uses 15 verbs to describe what love is. And I'm going to go through all 15, so please be patient. In, first, in four verses, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, we see love described in these 15 verbs. First, love is patient with others. Or as the King James Version states, love is long-suffering. Now, this is not just advice for married couples, right? <laughs> really, it is saying that love doesn't lose its temper. 
Now, how many of you have lost your temper at least once in your life? Everybody should raise your hand. All of you have lost your temper. If you're not raising your hand, I'm going to do something to make you lose your temper. No, <laughs> Second, love is kind. Now, we spoke about kindness last week and about how being kind is the ability to walk in another's shoes. But I think what Paul is also meaning here is that love says the tough stuff. Love tries to bring out the best in another person. Third, love is not jealous. Jealousy emerges out of our insecurity. And it's not just jealousy of, of a, somebody hitting on your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend. We, we tend to get stuck in that part. But it also includes envy. The grass is greener on the other side. Their house is bigger than mine. They have a better car than I do. They have a better job than I do. And we can get stuck in these cycles of being envious of others. And, and when we start acting in that way, well, we don't have love for somebody else, do we? We have envy. Fourth, love is not proud. Or as I like to translate, love does not brag. Now, what's the whole thing on, on the Reddit right now, the humble brag? Actually, it's been going on for five years. You know what the humble brag is? I think I mentioned it before. Where, where you, oh, I, I'm such a good person and I did this. Well, you know, if you really are such a good person, you don't need to brag about being a good person, right? So the more full of love we are, the less we have to brag about our ability to love. Boasting about love is just another way of saying that we're insecure in our relationships to others, aren't we? Fifth, love is not arrogant. When we brag, we seek praise from others. When we are arrogant, we seek power. Arrogance disrespects other people and uses them as stepping stones on our own way to individual success. And so Paul argues that if we are arrogant, if we are self-serving, then we do not have love. Sixth, love is not rude. Now there are some of us here who like to be straight talkers. How many of you are a straight talker? How many of you like to tell it as it is? <laughs> How many do it in such a way that people get angry with you at the end of the conversation? <laughs> All right. And this is tough for us who are like that. Because we want to be straight talkers. We want truth to be out there. And yet Paul argues and he reminds us that when we truly love another person, we are going to be in their shoes when they're hearing whatever criticism we are about to dispense. And we'll say, do I really want to hear it that way? Or is there a better way for me to say that? Right? How hard is that for some of us who like the straight talk? So we don't need to speak all of our thoughts about another person to their face. We have to put it in a way that they can understand and be able to grow and be able to respond better. Seventh, love does not seek its own way. Now this is a forgotten art in our culture, isn't it? It seems that everything we do is motivated about self-interest. We have winners, we have losers, there are people who bully each other. Correct? And yet Paul reminds us that to love means being willing to listen more than we are talking. It means that we don't always have to win. Because it's really not about winning and losing. It is about being able to come together and finding common ground. Eighth, love is not provoked. Whereas another translation of this part of the verse says, love is not touchy. How many of you are touchy people? That, that everything said to you just kind of set you off, right? It means that we don't get irritated easily by another person. Ooh, and that's such a hard one for some of us, because there are some people who just like to pound on that last nerve and jump on it and leap on it. <laughs> my kids like to do that. They know what to do to say to my wife and to me that just, I just want to do something to them. All right. Ninth, love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, this is pretty self-explanatory. If we are motivated by revenge, or if we think that the world is against us and we write everything down or have that mental hit list. How many of you have a mental hit list? No, you don't have to say that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. We have those people that are like, oh, I'm never going to invite them to my whatever, right? Well, we are not loving when we hold on to those wrongs that have happened in the past. Tenth, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Paul argues that we don't need to be captured by everything salacious that happens in our world. When we celebrate the bad news or the misdeeds of others, we are giving power to those misdeeds and those acts of evil. So put down your crime times, everybody. <laughs> Turn off your law and order. 
Stop listening to those podcasts about murder. Have you noticed that if you go on to your podcast on Apple, about three quarters of them are about serial killers? What is that about? Am I the only one to, that listens to podcasts? Okay. No. <laughs> Two thirds of them are just about murder. I don't know what that's about. Eleventh, love rejoices in truth. What is truth? Jack Nicholson once said in a rainy uniform. Some would argue that this world, that each of us has an individual truth. This is certainly the postmodern interpretation of ethics. And yet as Christians, we believe that there is a truth with a capital T. And it is taught to us by our scriptures, found in the tradition of our church as we gather together as a community. It is in our ability to reason things out and use our minds and also our personal experience as we understand God. One scholar looking at the scripture says that truth is necessary for love because it allows for us to tell what is right and wrong. And love is necessary for truth so we can be compassionate and forgiving. Truth and love have to come together. You just can't be a truth-telling person without also having compassion and love for others. Twelfth, love bears all things. Now, how many of you have ever had to build a roof and you had to, you always, why, why do you need so many rafters under the roof? You've heard about a load-bearing roof, right? You need to have enough snow in the northern climates. If too much snow falls on, it collapses your roof. And that's what Paul kind of means in here. He says, you know, love bears all things. In the same way that you need to build your house in a way that bears enough snow the way to the snow. And so, love does that for us. Love bears all things. It protects it protects people from the heaviness of the world. Thirteenth, I only got three more. Thirteenth, love believes all things. Now this one's hard. We've all heard the phrase, once bitten, twice shy, right? We can't help but be suspicious about other people and their motives. How many of you ever catch yourself being cynical like that? Oh, I wonder what they're doing. They're just doing that because, uh, you know, they're evil. Or they're trying to get ahead or try to steal something, right? And yet Paul argues here that as Christians we must trust. It means that it's, it's not guilty until proven innocent, as our world likes to teach. Instead, we need to give the benefit of the doubt and wait for evidence to come in before we judge another person or refuse to help them. We need to believe the best in other people, not the worst. But then you go on to 14. And love also hopes in all things. And this is greater than believing. This is not just gullible hopelessness. What Paul is arguing here is that we refuse to take failure as the final thing. How many of you feel like you've been in a relationship that is absolutely beyond repair whatsoever and nothing you can do can change it? Right? Well, it's true. Nothing you can do can change it. But what Paul is arguing is that love, the love of God, can change those situations. And that even if we do not see a way through those complicated things, we pray that God will help us have a way through. Love expects the best and allows room for God to work in our life and in the life of others. Finally, love endures all things. Love doesn't give up. Love doesn't retreat. Love looks beyond the current reality and seeks what might be in the future. Love is in it for the long haul. All right, so that's my 15-point sermon today. <laughs> and after we hear these 15 descriptions of love, <coughs> is there anyone in here who can argue that you're perfect? No. How many of you started feeling convicted after about the third one? You're like, man, I really do not know what it means to love, do I? In fact, I have to argue that the sermons I've prepared these last few weeks as we have been talking about ways to be, to be Christian, how to live out our lives, has been more preaching to me, I think, than maybe to you. Every day, I walk past the ribbons that are hanging down in our sanctuary. You know, we have these ribbons on our tables that I hope you are filling out. Uh, I didn't tell you about them today, but, you know... The encouragement I give you is, is please put the things that you're doing, these acts of kindness that you're doing in this world, the acts of love you are doing for others, the things that you are doing to express your Christian faith. Because whenever I walk into the sanctuary, and, and first week it was 12, and now it's about 36, 
I'm hoping to have 50 or 60 by the end of this week. I look at all those things that you have written, and it reminds me that I need to do more. I didn't know how y'all would react to it. And I think for some people it's hard to write down the things you do because you don't want to brag. And for others, you just happen to be naturally inclined to be kind and loving that it's second nature for you to do those things. But I have to tell you, those ribbons have been working on me. I open the doors a whole lot more for people. I, I actually return my, my grocery cart back to the where it's supposed to, so leaving in the middle of the parking lot. <laughs> Those are acts of kindness, if you think about it. If you ever see those guys having to chase those carts all around the food line parking lot? The ribbons remind me that I need to put my faith into action. I need to love. I, I need to be patient and kind and hopeful and enduring. I need to refrain from pettiness and jealousy and envy and anger and doubt. I need to be gracious. I need to endure. I need to refrain from all those things that cause harm to others. And I need to believe in the potential of others. This visual sign of your love and action has made me think about being a better Christian and about being a better pastor. So I thank you for your encouragement and grace and the forgiveness you offer me. You know, when we do that prayer of confession at the beginning of the service, and there's that moment of silence, and then you guys, you were forgiven. I feel that. Because I know I need to be forgiven. I know that I fall short every day at being the type of person that I ought to be. I get irritable. I know that I lose my temper. I know that I fail to give people second chances or even third chances. I know that there are times when I can be self-serving. So I thank you for helping me grow. And thank you for giving me a chance to hear and see how God is at work in your life. And as I reflect on that, maybe... That's where I think Paul is coming to in this 13th chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians. Maybe Paul wanted those first recipients of this letter to read that section and pause and say, what are the things that we can do to change our behaviors and our actions to others? How can we become better followers of Christ and love as Christ first loved us? So to recap what we've learned today, we've learned, one, that love is an action, not an emotion. We've learned that Paul wrote 15 verbs in four verses in 1 Corinthians, and maybe you could spout all 15 of those off, I can't. But I think there's one more final thing we need to learn today. And the third thing that Paul does in this chapter is to remind us that love is eternal. Our abilities, our talents, our gifts... Our work, all of that will end, but love remains. Our life, all time and space, all of creation will end, but love remains. All that we do, all that we don't do, all of it fades and disappears as the light of love and light and love of God fills us with perfection. So as I come to my thought, final thoughts in this sermon today, I, I want to challenge you with a couple of things. First, I challenge you to join me in reflecting on our lives and the decisions that we make and the actions that we do for others and to others. And I want you to join me in correcting the mistakes that we have made in our relationships. Join me in setting aside the bitterness and the jealousy and the slander and the hatred, the partisan bickering and the words that bring down and seek to defeat others. Finally, join me in love. Be patient, be kind, be hopeful, be truthful, be encouraging. And join God in changing our world. Amen. Amen. I don't know what it is about this sermon series, but my sermons keep on getting longer and longer. So, <laughs> nice. Uh, let us join together in our great Thanksgiving.